Welcome into the Yachts and Audibles podcast. I'm my Prime Eric Scopel, Jared Mack. On the show today, mailbag edition. Uh, we have got a lot to get to. It's that time of year where, hey, we're recording this on a Monday, the 9th. The National Championship game plays tonight in SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. Uh, end of college football season 2022 today. Uh, so we're at that point in the year where there's a lot of football talk, but there's also some recruiting talk and other sports are starting to bleed in to the mailbag as well, which is always a good thing. Uh, so let's let's dive into these. We've got a good range of questions, I think, from Eric. He just sent these over. Yeah, you guys are maybe not uh, probably a little late, <laughs> later than normal in terms of familiarizing yourself with the questions. So maybe this is a little bit more on the fly than normal. We had a we had a guest on a previous show. We're pre-recording for Wednesday. That'll be a fun show. Uh, check that out. But that 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 kind of interfered a little bit with our prep time or my prep time. I wanted to sleep in, so I I, I slept an extra eh, ten minutes. I mean, it's understandable. It's, you know, it's it's, a it's the off season, and it's a Monday. It's a Monday. It's the off season. Who cares? Why am I waking up at eight o'clock? Come on, let me sleep. <laughs> let me sleep. Uh, but our first question here, these are good questions. Our first one from at Isaiah O'Brien 11. What's the likelihood of landing the following portal and prep players? And he has three players here. Nichols Harbor, Jordan Birch, and Evan Williams. Plus any other portal players that Oregon fans should keep an eye on. So let's start with let's start with the first part there. Just We'll just go around the circle here and kind of what do we think? What, what's our thought process kind of on this? I think Harbor, who is the lone prep player from this group, a five-star player out of, I believe, Maryland. Is that correct? Baltimore area? DC uh, area. Yeah. To me, it's the same thing, having been back there, kind of. They basically feel like you don't know when you're in DC or when you're in Baltimore, you, when you're like kind of driving don't. through. Like it's, it's just right there. So it's like yeah. LA. It's like in LA. Yeah. To some that, that, like, LA, it's like, it's just around forever. That just is never ending. You just and keep driving and you're still in Los Angeles. Um, but anyway, but besides the point, uh, Harbor is just a freak of an athlete. For those who haven't gone and watched his track highlights, the guy runs sub 10-3 at 6'5", 225, which is just like legitimately doesn't happen. Um, it's about the same time. A DK Metcalf, who's about the same size, ran a similar time as like a 25-year-old professional athlete at an open 100 I want to say last spring or summer. Um, so that's like the only person that's really comparable. I guess if you really want to get crazy in the track circuit, you talk to Usain Bolt, who is technically the same size, but that guy could not play football. Um, so, but like Harbor's a big time athlete. He wants to play. It sounds like offense. That's kind of what's opened the door for Oregon. And they weren't really in this recruitment until the last month. And now he's going to take a visit soon. Um, of the three, I'll say probably the l- lowest level of confidence is for me would be with Harbor just because I think the other two players from everything we've heard, I will not say it's a done deal, but it seems pretty close that they're going to land. The other two guys are pretty, I think you'd be pretty optimistic about it, but Harbor's still a guy like I, I think if they're going to land a prep guy from everything, like Steve Wolfong had an update, I think over the weekend, or maybe that was Friday, they've run together where he was kind of optimistic about Oregon making a push here about getting involved, kind of brought up the fact that they're, um, Pitch has been both the, the track and the football thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Harbor wants to be an Olympic tr- track sprinter as well as a, a football player. So it sounds like Oregon has an, a compelling pitch, but I still say that's the lowest likelihood. But like I, I would say it's maybe a little over 50%. Am I too optimistic there? I think, I, I, I don't know. I agree with you with the fact that he is, uh, I'm probably the least optimistic about Oregon landing Harbor's talent. Um, I, I think the best thing that Oregon has going for them is their world-renowned track program that's been yeah. like the face of this school for longer than the football program has. Um, and that's something that not a lot of schools can offer. And then on the flip side, you also have a really good football program. You also have an opportunity for Harbor to, I mean, I, I would imagine he comes in and plays tight end. Um, he played tight end in the All-American Bowl. Um, he has, I guess, the size that he could Play wide receiver. I mean, I know he's six foot five, but maybe he drops a few pounds. But um, yeah, he he has said multiple times that he wants to do track and football in college, and he says multiple times that he wants to play offense in college because adding uh, adding weight would mean that he would become a defensive player. He doesn't want to add weight. He wants to stay at this general level and work on his speed because, like Eric ran through, he's got world class speed. He has something where. 
Um, if he gets the right coaching staff and he gets the right training program, he could be somebody really big um, in the in the track world in the running circles. But I would feel the least optimistic about landing him just because he's a prep guy. Uh, Oregon got late in the cycle. I know that they do have uh, Harbor coming for a visit at the end of January, the final visit before uh, signing day, the real signing day. Um, so that bodes well for Oregon. But if you're asking me to rank them all, he's third. Um, and like Eric said, I think we're all you know cautiously optimistic towards Birch and Evan Williams. Um, I think those two guys are significant impact guys right away. And I will have a question later in the show about, um, you know, what, what the defense might look like next season. But um, those guys, I think, hypothetically speaking, um, would be an, an immediate impact for Oregon's defense. Um, Harbor would be more of a project, but if things click with him, it could really work out for Oregon's tight end room. Um, however, I do, not that I fear it, but I also think that things could just click for him on the track circuit and he would never touch a football again, which would probably be a good idea for him if, if he's really that good on the track circuit and why bother risking an injury um, playing football unless he's truly that passionate about it. But um, regardless, I, Oregon being in contention for these three guys is a really good um, just overall synopsis of how, how well Oregon is recruiting and how well they're able to, to reach coast to coast for their guys. I think it the, the list is inverse inverse. If yeah, if I you agree. started at the bottom yeah. and went your way up, uh, most likely that or at least likely that's how it would go. I, I think Evan Williams is all but going to be a duck. I think Birch is kind of that one where it's in Oregon's favor, but it's not done yet. It it's got to get wrapped up. Uh, and there are rumors I haven't been able to confirm that he was here this weekend uh, for an official visit. Um, we do know that Soul was, um, we do know that, uh, Evan Williams was Soul being Connor Soul, the, the transfer from ASU who committed. Um, and then there's Nicholas Harbor. If you're Oregon and it, look, the basketball team, the women's basketball team, I shouldn't say the men's team, the women's team, the football team. I think even the softball team has used Hayward Field on recruiting visits for their sport, uh, a facility that none of those guys really or women will really ever use. But it's it. I think it's hands down, no questions asked, the best facility Oregon has in its athletic department arsenal. Uh, when you look at Matt Nine Arena, you look at Hayward Field, Austin Stadium, uh, PK Park, um, the, the Mariota Center, the Mo, the new building they're going to build. Maybe the new building, the new indoor will, will rival Hayward. But I think from just a pure, awesome facility, Hayward is unmatched um, on campus. And so if Nicholas Harbor is true to his word, and we have no reason to doubt him that he wants to be an elite football player and he wants to be an elite track star. Like Oregon is the school. If, if you want both of those worlds, Oregon is the school. And so getting him here is going to be the biggest hurdle. I think if you can get him here and you can showcase maybe even more, just the track program. I think the football program speaks for itself. Um, he's a track guy. He should know the history of, of Oregon, like Jared said, and the prestige that it, that it carries. But I just think getting him around the facilities, getting him around the, the people out of Oregon could really change the dynamic of our perception of the likelihood of Nicholas Harper. I, I still don't think it's likely, but getting him on campus is that first big hurdle. And it's a big hurdle that could, that could knock a bunch of dominoes down if, if, it, if it happens. It always surprises me how infrequently a school like Oregon, which has one of the five best track programs in the country, and let's say one of the best 15 football programs in the country, has so little overlap. Like, what, what, like Devin Allen's really the only success story who's done both at a high level. Just surprised you don't see it more often. It'd be cool if Harbor was the next one to come in and do it. Um, to Jared's point about concerns with him focusing all his attention on track, that would be a really idealistic 
perspective from him, I think, not to go too far down that rabbit hole, but just from the financial compensation perspective, it's not really comparable. Even if you're like, like if you're the very best track sprinter in the world, I guess if you're Usain Bolt, if he becomes Usain Bolt, it's a different conversation because he has all sorts of other ways to make money because of his prestige as an athlete. But most of those guys are not making comparable financial compensation to what even the lowest end professional football player, I'm not even talking to the NFL, would be making. So like the financial part is where you potentially would just have to be like, okay, if I'm going to do this, like being a track athlete, you're not going to make a ton of money for the most part, for the most part. So that, that, that would be the only part with regards to that. But I think it's really intriguing and exciting that, that Oregon's in on this recruit, both for both sports and just in terms of selling a track program, but also being able to use that to maybe help the football program. I'm just surprised it doesn't happen more often at a school like this, um, but it doesn't. It, it really hasn't happened in about a decade almost, which is, again, probably a little bit, to me, a little bit surprising. I wonder if part of that is because a lot of those players are going to be sprinters and the Pacific Northwest isn't. It's not impossible to be an elite sprinter in the Pacific Northwest, but it's not the best location. Like a lot of the sprinters are all in like Texas or uh, LA or Florida, like, it's hard to get sprinters to the Pacific Northwest because of the weather. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that. It, it, Oregon's, on, on Oregon's the sprinting program is pretty good. On the, you know, and it's weird because we're now restarting it. So it's hard. I mean, we could go down. Yeah. Should we make this a Go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> under, under, under Robert Johnson, that was not the case. Prior to that, under Robert Johnson, they were very good in the sprints. Prior to that, it was, yes. a, it was a distant school. So, like, it just depends on your coaching staff. Just like, you know, a Mario... I think there's a whole conversation. A Mario Cristobal football program is built around power run game athletes, whereas maybe a Dan Lanning team is built differently. Um, Oregon has had a lot of success with sprinter, sprinters historically under Robert Johnson on the women's side. I think they had like four straight 100 meter champions or something like that. Like they've done really well um, on the on the men's side. Maybe not quite as much success, although I believe they have the youth. Again, we're going down a huge track rabbit hole, which which is fine for me because I like track, but. Uh, I believe they have the number one track sprinter. Uh, like I think he's the youth record holder signed to come in. He's from another country that's not the United States and just won the double 100, 200 championships, the world championships. I can't remember his name. I'm butchering this. But uh, anyway, track. It's all good. Great you're, not, you're not a track insider. We don't, we don't expect. Well, I know, I know a pretty name. good amount. It's just I don't remember the kid's name or what country it's he's okay. from. But they brought, they're bringing in a, a guy who runs, I think, about four-tenths of a second faster than Harbor, which was also to my point earlier of like, if he thinks he's going to win a world, he said he wanted to win a, an Olympic gold medal. And I'm like, that's really, really optimistic because he probably steps foot up at Oregon and is like their fifth or sixth fastest sprinter based upon the times that I've seen. So anyway, let's move on because uh, I don't think we've, we've done 13 minutes and like seven of them been track related, which is probably not the uh, target demo. Uh, second question. And I think this is a target demo question because I've seen this question asked a half a dozen ways on our message board or uh, in this week's. Uh, tweet asking for questions. This one comes from at a grumpy old vet. How worried should we be about not getting to 85 scholarships? And if we don't, what happens? Hashtag go ducks, hashtag it's an audible. Thanks for using the hashtag. Um, I just saw a lot of people asking about 85 and we had a little bit of discussion beforehand about like why that is. And <clears throat> I think it's because I'm pretty sure this is by far the most scholarships Oregon has ever had on its books, even though it's not officially on the books. At any point, like ever, like Oregon is what we decided before the show. Ninety three, maybe ninety four. We're just we just talked about three transfer players and a prep player that they might also land. Like let's say, let's be really optimistic and say they get all three of those guys. Well, now you'd be literally at ninety six. You'd be eleven over. Mm -hmm. So like I understand the concern um, and why it's different than most years because typically you're looking at it maybe you're a, a guy or two over. Right now you're like almost a dozen over potentially. Um, I would. I'm not worried at all. Um, like it, it, no. I, I know of zero story. And this is kind of what we were talking about before. Cause I actually don't have a clear answer to the second part of what happens if they don't get under 85 or to 85 or under, because I, I'm familiar with zero instances in the history of college football where it hasn't, because I don't think you can actually like play football if you're over 85. Like I, I, someone can fact check me on that. If there's like some wiggle wound, but I think you, I think you just don't get to play if you have more scholarship athletes, like that would make sense. Why would you have a, a limit that no one can break if it's like a, a real soft rule. So um, I'm not worried about it. What you are going to see though, because of it is a lot more guys have to transfer or medically retire. Um, 
Oregon has had the good fortune of having a lot of its key older defensive players decide to come back, right? Brandon Dorless, Popo Amavai, uh, Taki Taimani, Mace Funa. Those are four guys who could have gone pro um, who are all coming back. And I think that's a really positive thing. But those, the fact that those guys all decided to come back, that's four scholarships that could have gone towards, you know, the, the, the roster turnover now that don't. And so when you get a combination of a lot of older players deciding to stick around with a huge crop of recruits, which again, like almost three dozen now, like 20, I think it's 28 right now, plus all the transfer additions, you get into a spot where the numbers get hairy. But to answer the just the both questions, uh, I guess a little more uh, directly, I, I'm, I wouldn't be worried at all. This will this will this will work itself out. Unfortunately, that means there's going to be a lot more players who leave the program. And then to the second question of what happens if they don't, I, I wouldn't even put that under your consideration because there's there's no way Oregon is ill-equipped enough to like start a season with 86 or 87. Like I just don't even think you have a. I don't think you're an operable program if you have more guys than that. It would be like if a in the NFL a team was like. What's the limit? Uh, fuck that. We're going to start with three more than that. Sorry, sorry for the language. Whoa, oh, whoa, like, like, whoa, whoa. Sorry, I'm, you know, but like, like, screw that. We're just going to start with like five more players than we're allowed to. Who cares? Who cares about rules? It's not that family of a program, is it? Sorry if you're in your car and you're. I mean, I've I've been yelled at for saying damn or goddamn or something well, I'm like get, that. I'm going to so. get called out in the comments. You're going to get a DM. Peace to Eric in the comments. Oh, because, boy. I know. You guys are going to give me a hard time for using an F word. How dare I? Uh, no, but, but, my, but, but it's my point. It's like it's 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 not a thing. <laughs> no, it's not a thing. We can't open this up being a swearing podcast as a man from Massachusetts. We just can't do it, or else Sorry. I'll, I'll do it in every sentence. So, Apologies. no, I mean, I like to to answer the question. I wouldn't be worried about it. Um, I, I like Eric said. I've seen this a lot on the message board on Twitter on the Twitterverse. Um, a lot of schools go over the 85 scholarship limit at one point. It's just this is how college football works nowadays. Um, like Eric has mentioned a couple of times on this podcast before, it kind of sucks that you're talking about how they need to get guys out of the program, almost push them out. Um, and that's just unfortunately how it works. Um, I think you can kind of look at this from a different perspective now that most players are taking some sort of valuation and, and monetary value um, with yeah. their scholarship, not necessarily like, you know, like, signing up with a, with a restaurant down the street at their local university that pays them, whatever. It's kind of as, as if it's a, almost a real job now, almost if it's real professional football where uh, they're going to overhire, they're going to hire somebody who could potentially um, do your job better than you could. And while that is a very um, straight line way of thinking and not very, um, not taking emotions into account, um, scholarship math doesn't take emotions into account either. And I think Dan and company are just trying to build the best football team that they can. Um, and that right now includes signing people over the limit to, to kind of say in those specific position groups to say, hey, these guys we brought in, you guys are from the last coaching staff. Um, we want our guys to play. So our guys are probably going to play. You might not play. It might be time to reconsider your time here at Oregon. And I know that sounds bad on the surface, but it's going on at every program across the country, especially programs that have new coaches. Um, it's still happening at USC. It's still happening at, uh, at Washington. It happens in college basketball all the time, too. I, we watched uh, Oregon and Utah the other day in, in college basketball. You know, half of the Utah team is, is, the, is from Utah State, where the, where the coach was originally from. So the guys at Utah beforehand had to be pushed out or they left because they knew he was bringing in his own guys. And I know Dan isn't necessarily bringing in, like, 30 Georgia players, but he's bringing in guys that he wants and guys from the previous regime are seeing that they know that he's probably going to be playing them over um, a Mario Cristobal or the, <laughs> the one Mark Helfrich player on the team left in <laughs> Cam McCormick, which I thought was a funny stat, but they're, they're going to be playing. They're going to be playing Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy and Will Stein's guys over Mario Cristobal and a couple of these guys. So I, I wouldn't be worried about the scholarship math. I think it'll end up, uh, evening out or Oregon even getting under at one point. Um, it's just, that's just kind of how it goes right now. And I think Dan is just building his best team. And the answer, if he goes over the scholarship limit, I have no idea. Maybe they just, they rescind Oregon football. They're, they're no longer a okay. program and they have now have to do rugby. I don't know. Not, no, not worried at all. 
uh, and this this may not get sorted out until June. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the transfer window that opens up in the spring. I believe it's May 1st. I don't know when it closes. Um, I imagine this is just speculation putting pieces together here. Oregon will probably be done with spring football May 1st, if not that first week in May. Um, to give those players a clear path to finding a new home before next season. Um, and the reason being is they need to get down to 85 by, I, I think the rule is you need to be down to 85 by whenever your summer enrollment is, or whenever these guys enroll, you can, you can, you can't have more than 85 guys on scholarship on campus at one point in time. So you could, you could say like Jerry Mixon, a, a linebacker that's committed to Oregon, a three-star guy. He signed with the ducks. He's not enrolling early. Um, you could, you could say like, you could have a linebacker in theory on this roster or another, another position that goes through spring football. And then maybe at the end of May decides this isn't for me. I'm not going to play. The coaches made it clear transfers out. And then next, the, the, the next month, Jerry Mixon arrives and that's where his scholarship came from. Um, it, it's, I'm not worried at all about it, and it may not get sorted out until June 1st, June 15th. I don't know, but it, it's going to happen because, like Eric said, like I can't think of a single instance where a school was out there going, oh, sorry, guys, we're uh, at 87. Um, we'll, we'll take this one out because we can't recall that ever happening. We've tried looking it up for what the punishment is. We can't find anything, so I'm just going to assume – uh, it's like nuclear winter if if you go over 85. Nuclear winter. That's the strongest uh, possible. It's a good punishment. band name. It is a good band <laughs> name. But that's a, that would be a tough. That would be a tough punishment. Um, Gonna write that down. Yeah, write that one down. I apologize for using the F, for, using, for using an F, a strong F. That was probably bad for him. It's uh, a hard I, F. I got yeah. fired up. I got fired up. That was a hard F. It was too hard. To it. I should have. We'll figure softer, it out. Softer if I want to use one next time. Um, <laughs> Third question from uh, at Robbie Parnes. Thank you, Robbie, by the way, for being a loyal listener, asking questions. I feel like Robbie's one of the OG question askers. Definitely been getting his in over the years. Robbie asks this time, as things stand now, what do you anticipate the starting 11 to be on defense next year? Do you expect an upgrade in talent and production? And then he opines, last year was bad, but it seems most of the optimism comes from question marks and he lists several players that are newcomers in uh Kyrie Jackson Kyrie Jackson Justine Jacobs and uh Matteo Uyunglele and he also finishes by using the hashtag odds and audibles which we always appreciate um I have scribbled down I didn't scribble I guess I'm kind of I, I've written you always off, scribble. On, on it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you if you try it's a scribble. yeah I can't actually write um I, yeah, I've got journalism handwriting but I've I've actually written on a word document here uh up like a real wow. a real rough a real rough 11 here um curious to see if you guys disagree this is kind of where I think it's at right now with the recent news of returners uh on the defensive line Casey Rogers hasn't said anything he was your starting uh, one of your starting defensive tackles in 2022 until he announces he's not returning. I'm just going to include him there. Um, mm -hmm. If he doesn't come back, you've got a couple of other guys you could fit in there. I think like Keon War Hudson plays the same position I thought played pretty well last year. Um, you've got maybe one of these two guys I'm about to mention who I think will battle for nose tackle who could, in theory, move over, and that's Popo Amavai who comes back from injury, and then Taki Taimani uh, with Brandon Dorless who just on Sunday announced his return. Uh, retaining his defensive end starting position. So I think that right there, like a Rodgers, I'll go Amavai, Dorless combo would be, I think, starting three up front. The edge feels like Mace Funa. Um, we mentioned Jordan Birch's name earlier on the podcast. I think if he were to actually end up at Oregon, uh, yes. he's starting at edge. He's starting at edge or he's <laughs> starting somewhere else on that defensive line and you're moving people around. Maybe, maybe you move Dorless to the Rodgers defensive tackle position, the place where he played a little bit in the past, slide uh, uh, Birch into that defensive end place that Dorless currently occupied last season. I don't know, uh, but Birch would change things. So um, 
Inside linebacker, it's a, kind of a mess. I'll be curious to see. They just landed a, a guy who I was had basically no knowledge of going into the day, which I shouldn't say is super unusual, but the fact he's a Pac-12 player, I don't really know what to do with – is it pronounced so well, Soul? I don't, I don't really – I forgot to look it up. I was going to look it up. I, I'm going to start saying with, so well. I you spoke, spoke with, with uh, Chris Cartman last night. Uh, Cartman covers – runs our airs on a state site, uh, Sun Devil Sanctuary um, – or Sun Devil Source, sorry. Uh, and he called him Soul. Okay. Soul. Um, right. And yeah. he also made it very clear he's not a um, inside linebacker at his best. He is a Bennett Williams hybrid linebacker safety in his best form. Okay. Yes. I, I didn't have him in this starting twosome anyway, but I just did. I just have had a hard time recalibrating that addition. It just struck me as sort of unusual. I'm going to trust the staff because there are a couple. Remember, we were like, why are they adding Jordan Riley last year? That's yeah. like, that's a weird addition. The guy started every game this year, so and he was good. And he was good, and he was one of your better interior guys. So um, I, I currently have Justin Jacobs, the Iowa transfer, and Jeffrey Bossa at inside linebacker. Um, Bossa, I've been very critical of him in the past. I just don't know if there's anyone on the on the roster right now who I'm more confident in based upon his playing experience. Keith Brown is a player to know. Devin Jackson. There's a lot of younger guys. I'm sure that'll be open competitions, but that would be where I'd go. Gets a little weird in the secondary. Because I don't really know what everyone's going to do here or mm-hmm. what, what everybody's best position is. So I have a couple of scenarios. Um, and this is, again, assuming everyone comes back because, like, we don't know what Jamal Hill, Steve Stevens, or Brian Addison will do. They all could, in theory, mm-hmm. call it a Please. career, move on, do whatever, you know, and not be with the team. So assuming everyone's there, I have two different corner starting combos. And it's because I just don't know where Quez's best position is. One would be Quez with. Alabama transfer Kyrie Jackson. Um, that would be that's my number one option. If they move Quez to safety, which I would contend is probably his best spot, although I thought he finished last season pretty strong. Um, if that's the case, then you've got either Florence or Manning with Kyrie Jackson at corner is is, is the way I'd go. And I probably would lean Manning. I thought he played pretty well in the bowl game, actually, but mm-hmm. I felt the same way a year ago, and then he didn't start. So <laughs> I, I guess we'll see. Uh, nickel, there's actually not a true returning nickel because Hill basically played deep safety for most of the season, but Hill has experience there, so I put him at that spot. Um, and then I have two different uh, combinations at safety because, again, I don't, if I have bridges at safety in one, that means somebody else isn't there. So I have Steve Stevens and Brian Addison was one pairing back there. If Evan Williams joins the, the team again, by the way, I'm not including players who haven't officially joined the team or committed. He probably takes one of these spots. Maybe he just takes the position his brother played last year. Um, and then the other one would be a Bridges Addison slash Bridges Stevens combo in the back end, which was, I know, a Jared Mack favorite during spring was that Bridges uh-huh. Addison yeah. safety combination we never got to see. So I don't know. Okay. That was, there was my rough run through on it. I know Jared will officially do his um, defensive two deep in about, what do we say? We said that last day the portal would be open. So about the 18th. Just over yeah. a week's time, you'll be we'll be both be publishing days. publishing our uh, offense and defensive two deep predictions. But um, there, I did a dry run on the defense. Uh, how did I do, Jared? Is there anything that you think I'm that you really disagree with? No, I don't really disagree with anything. I just had like a few a few different things. Uh, I had Keon starting alongside Casey Rogers instead of Popo. Um, I just think that's more of what I liked what I liked seeing from Keon. I haven't seen Popo and in a long time and see what he has to play. Um, Popo was, I, I, I like, I like Popo more in a third down situation where he can rush the passer. Cause I think that's what he's just frankly better at. I think Keon is a bigger body and someone who is better in the run game. Um, like, like you mentioned, Eric, like I'm not including Birch or Evan Williams, who we both feel good about coming to Oregon just because they're not here at Oregon yet. So I can't an- anticipate them playing for the ducks next season. Um, but if they do, end up committing to Oregon, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast. I think those guys are both immediate starters. Williams at one of the safety roles, maybe even nickel, and then Birch at either defensive end or um, the edge rushing position where I have Mace Funa starting right now. Um, and it, this just kind of comes back to, like I have Kyrie Jackson and, and Triquest Bridges as like, starting cornerbacks. Um, this just comes back to whether or not Bridges is a safety or Bridges is a corner. And if Oregon lands another 
cornerback in the transfer portal or Dante Manning or Julio Florence step up to be the real deal. Or maybe it's Kamari Terrell who played a lot of his season last year at cornerback rather than at nickelback or safety where he was originally recruited to. If one of those guys steps up, I could see Bridges moving back to safety because I just think that, I think I think that's where he's best suited at. I think his skill set, his length, and his athleticism are best suited oh. for a free safety position. I think he was good at corner. I think it's incredibly impressive that he was recruited as a safety, played safety in high school, and has able to done uh, able to do a decent job at being a cornerback at the Power Five level for the last two seasons. Um, I know he was burnt early against Georgia and BYU, but I, I thought he played really well down the stretch. Um, We'll use PFF here just because why not? But was uh, Oregon's second highest rated cornerback on the team behind Christian Gonzalez, who's going to be like a sure sure round or sure first round pick. So I think he's good at corner. I just think that he's going to be, I think that he would be really, really good at safety. Um, so, but that needs, that requires somebody to step up. And I'm not overly optimistic about somebody stepping up, which means I have Jamal Hill, Brian Addison, and either Evan Williams or Steve Stevens as the, the, three safeties on the field at the time. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily an upgrade um, because those guys saw the field a lot last year for a team that wasn't great in, in pass coverage as we've documented uh, many a times here. So yeah, we'll see. And then I forgot, but Justin Jacobs and Jeffrey Bassa are my linebackers. I don't see it going any other way. I know Keith Brown was, was good against North Carolina um, in the holiday bowl, but that's one game. Um, I need, I need, I need to see more. And that's, that's no, that's no knock on Keith Brown. Cause I did think he played exceptional in that game, but in order to take a starting position away from Jeffrey Bassa or Justin Jacobs, I know who, who both have experience starting and playing linebacker for a long time now. Uh, I just need to see more from the man. I think he'll, if he's, if he's that good, he'll prove it and he could start, but that's not a bad option to be a third linebacker off the bench. And then Connor soul, uh, special teams ace. If you read my how does Oregon or how does Soul fit into Oregon's linebacker room, uh, he'll be a backup. He played 188 snaps at Arizona State last year. 132 of them, 122 of them were as an inside linebacker. That's where he's going to play if he's on the field. Uh, he only played on the field when it was a nickel save, nickel coverage where they had three linebackers and he played more of a nickel role, anyways. So, like Matt said, he's more of that Bennett Williams type. He's 6'1, 220 pounds. He's one of the faster guys, has 11 career tackles on special teams, which is pretty darn good considering Kamari Terrell led the way with three this past season and Sol had seven on, on his own. So he's going to be a special teams guy and a backup linebacker. I I won't um, run through my entire depth chart because <laughs> I'm the third guy. Yeah, no, pretty boring. Kind of, kind of an awkward <laughs> spot for you to be a third person to run through an 11-person depth chart. Um, so instead I will just highlight that I think the safety room is completely open. Like you have to open this up to everybody. And that includes maybe moving guys positions, TriQuest bridges, maybe moves to safety and maybe they get Florence Manning on the field at the same time or Kyrie. Uh, Kyrie Jackson gets his way into the starting lineup, which I'm not sold necessarily. He's going to be a day one starter. He's got to earn it um, right away. I, I, I think Connor soul is probably going to be someone that's more of a nickelback than a linebacker at Oregon. Um, Cartman was like very negative towards ASU's linebackers and meaning their coaching. Um, he said it was bad and that they just never really got better. And that, so the, the defense that they were playing, like that wasn't his, he played a lot of inside linebacker, but it wasn't like his best spot on the field. They just didn't em, employ the, a, a, a Bennett Williams type role at ASU. Um, and he's like, if so, if, if they, if Oregon has like a hybrid linebacker safety position, like that's where he's going to play. That's what's best for him that, that, you know, it, he'll flourish in that type of, of a role. And lo and behold, Oregon does have that type of, of a role uh, in their secondary. So I, maybe he plays a little bit of inside linebacker, but I think this is a guy that could be a nickel player um, at Orca down the road. And then like defensively, like up front, still looking for that pass rush. Not sure where it's going to come from. Um, I also think the D line 
could see some transfers. Um, there's a lot of guys. There's not a lot of positions. Casey Rogers could come back. Keon Ware Hudson, I think, is going to be like a fifth-year junior um, and hasn't had a, a level or a, a, a ascending career. It's been up and down. Some of it's because of injury. Um, what does he do? What does uh, Michaela Fisi do? Suavi Podi, what does he do? Um, Jake Shipley. These are all guys that haven't played a lot in the last couple of seasons. And now Popo's coming back. Now Dorless is coming back. Casey Rogers could be back. And do they want to stare down another year where the starter ahead of them is back and they're not going to be playing starter minutes? So I, I think – if, if we were talking about how they get down to 85, like this could be a position group that, that sees some turnover. I'm not going to say six guys are going to transfer, but it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if we see three by the end of spring. Well, and you're right in terms of when you – I remember when you ran through the scholarship chart, it was pretty evident that they had almost too many front seven guys yeah. on their – I mean, in terms of edge, defensive, interior guys. So – there will be there will have to be some processes, if you will. And then before we had to break, just to I guess kind of wrap up the segment on, um, do you see expect an upgrade in talent slash production? Uh, you know, it's it's really early, so it's hard to we don't know what the roster looks like. But I do think it's notable that like probably three of your five best defensive players, I guess more than that when you include Bennett, aren't back, and a lot of the guys that you're replacing them with, I'm not just aren't. I'm not certain that they're upgrades for sure. Like Christian Gonzalez is, I think, more talented than any corner that is set to be on Oregon's roster next year. So whoever plays that position will be a lesser player from my standpoint. Um, Justin Jacobs has the upside athletically to be maybe better than Noah Sewell, who I think had a very underwhelming final season. But there's no guarantee that that's a huge upgrade. Um they have to add a pass rusher of an edge player to, you know, to indicate that that's an improvement because Mace Funa, who was the G.J. Johnson's backup, and they were also kind of playing in different situations. They're kind of situationally used differently. But G.J. Johnson's gone, and they haven't really addressed that. I know you mentioned Mateo. We mentioned Jordan Birch. Like, there's opportunity there. But, like, I, I kind of am in a place where I, I, have, it's a hard time, I have a hard time saying, like, hey, yeah, they're going to be way better defensively when they lose a bunch of key players. And, Again, I really like some of the additions they've made this offseason. Like, I, in fact, I, I like kind of all of them. Uh, you know, I, again, I'm going to trust the staff, the staff with Soul because that was a guy who was so far off my radar that when I saw him commit and then I researched, I was kind of like, this is just a weird one. Um, but it sounds like Matt and Jared kind of see potential for roles there going forward. But I just don't, I just haven't seen yet defensively the the types of uh, upgrades to the portal um, quite yet. But I mean, there's guys clearly who are, I think I've, I've included two are going to start. I think, but there's still more work to be done there in, in my mind. And I think if they come away with Evan Williams and Jordan Birch, that certainly gets you closer to being a better defense. But again, I'm still not quite so, so sold yet that that's the case. I'm not sold they're going to be significantly better. You know, but like, can't be, it's hard to be sold of anything with the way it's set up right I, now. I think they, I, mm-hmm. I think there's a real possibility they could be worse than what they were this season. I mean, you lose your best corner, you lose your best safety, you lose your best edge rusher. And and your best inside linebacker. Yeah, and your best inside linebacker. And so, like, you, so far, you haven't signed anybody um, that I think you look at and say automatically that guy's an upgrade from the guys that they're replacing. Yeah. No, I mean, at, at least not on paper. But yeah, these aren't... I mean, the guys beforehand, other than Christian Gonzalez, weren't necessarily what Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy wanted on paper. Um, they fit the mold on paper because they were the high five stars or high, high or, or whatever the case may be. Um, I think taking an Evan Williams over a Bennett Williams would be an upgrade um, at points. I think that we, we've talked about this on the podcast where Bennett Williams was could, could be a defensive liability at points. And this isn't for me trying to um, snub him on his way out. Like I, Bennett was an outstanding individual and a good player at Oregon. Um, but there are upgrades to be made there. Noah Sewell had an extremely uh, subproductive season by his standards. I think that Justin Jacobs with his athletic ability and his, um, 
his coaching and that and his play style could could produce very similar, if not better, numbers than Noah Sewell did this past year. Um, we still have yet to talk about most of the freshman class, which include defensive personnel. I, I don't have any of them starting, but that's not to say that they won't come in and make an impact. Um, it's still really hard to even figure out what this defense is going to look like because we're in January. Um, we've got a lot of months until we actually see the defense even take the field in a game, let alone a spring practice. So I'm not, I'm not going to say either way if this is a, a significant upgrade or a significant downgrade in, in what this defense is compared to this past season because there's still a lot left, like you guys have both mentioned, um, to be tackled here, no pun intended. And there's still a lot more that Dan and, and Tosh can do and, and should do for this program on the defensive side of the ball. And, again, it's their program. I think at this point, a year in, you got to put some some type of blind trust into what they see and what they can do. Sure. All right, we're going to take a quick break, long overdue. Uh, but really good discussion, the first three questions in. When we come back, we'll finish up the mailbag. All right, welcome back to the Austin Audible's podcast. Uh, three questions in, two more to go. Uh, Eric, fire away. All right, this one comes from at N. Drebbing. Do you think that Jordan James or a true freshman will get more carries than Noah Whittington in 2023? We had a couple questions about the run game that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, I think my answer to this one on face value is no. And that's less to do with what I think of Jordan James, Dante Dowdell, Jaden Lamar, the true freshmen that are being referenced. And more than I just like, I kind of think no Whittington's pretty good. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people, not a lot, but there's certainly been some discussion on, our, on the uh, Duck Territory message board about Whittington's role. I think there was a sense that there was like, I know it's not quite nepotism, but there was some level of that with the way things went down because his position coach, Carlos Lachlan, was also his position coach at Western Kentucky, was favoritism at play. Uh, did did Whittington take reps from, you know, Sean Dollars and Byron Cardwell, who were returners to the program, who maybe should have should have gotten more opportunity? Like I've seen these kind of thoughts bandied about on the internet, and I just think they're kind of all bunk, if you ask me. Um, I think Noah Whittington's a really good running back. I think had Oregon not added Bucky Irving, I won't say Whittington would have produced the same stats because if you look at it from a yards per carry perspective, it's not on par with with Irving who had, what was it, Matt, the third best yards per carry average we, from an Oregon player in program history? Yeah, we looked it up in I'm a single season. Sure. Third sounds right. I can't recall that one as much as the Bo Nick stuff, but I think third was right. Yeah, it was like behind the Michael James season, and I want to say maybe one Royce Freeman season or something like that. So, yeah. like, it, Bucky had a really productive year. I won't say Whittington would have been better. But I don't think Whittington is like a slouch at all. I think he's a really high end player. And the fact that he's your backup running back and is capable of having 100 yard games and of carrying an offense for a couple quarters and, and, and being explosive as a pass catcher, there's like a lot of reasons to really like Noah Whittington. So, um, I would anticipate the roles are probably somewhat similar. The only kind of reason to maybe question that is just Will Stein, new offensive coordinator, maybe has a different feel for for how to utilize running backs. But, you know, at the same time, I think a lot of that has to do with the position coach. And um, I imagine Carlos Lachlan liked what he saw this last year. I know I liked what I saw from the running backs. I had them graded the best position group on the team for a reason. Um, and it wasn't all Bucky Irving. Part of it was that I thought Winnington showed – a lot. I really like Jordan James. I, you know, he towards the end of the season received a little bit more opportunity outside of short yardage and goal line, and I thought ran really hard. Had a couple of nice runs in the Holiday Bowl. So I, I like Jordan James a lot. I think he should have a role in the offense. I would like to see if they can find a role for Dante Dowdell or Jaden Lamar, maybe one of those two guys, just to kind of get one of those guys' feet wet because you have to recognize that after twenty three, both Irving and Whittington could be gone. Um, but I expect Whittington to continue to be the number two and for him to, I won't say, carry the exact same number of times as he did this last year um, as the question's getting at. But uh, I certainly think he's going to carry it more than, than Jordan James or one of the freshmen. As, as I think he's your number two guy. Not to dismiss the question, but absolutely not. I don't understand the Noah Whittington slander um, that I've seen on the message boards that I've heard in real in real life. Um People have always said that he's not that good. Uh, he is. He's averaging almost six yards a carry. He almost put up a thousand yards from scrimmage this season. I don't. 
I, I don't know what the what the what the issue is here with with Whittington and, and the and the play style he has. He's a hard runner. He, he clearly won the number two job um, from the very very start of the season. I think he might have started the first game of the year against Georgia, if my memory recalls correctly. Um, there was a time where everybody did not like Bucky Irving following the Georgia game. And everybody asked, why is he playing over over Byron Cardwell? Byron Cardwell wouldn't have dropped that pass. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, these guys are good, both Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington. And I don't doubt that Dante Dowdell will be good. And I don't doubt that Jalen Lamar will be good. And I don't doubt that Jordan James is already good. I like Jordan James a lot. Noah Whittington and Bucky Irving are your are your two and one in order. I, I There's no way that I don't think that Jordan James and a freshman combined are going to get the same total number of carries that, Jordan, that Noah Whittington is going to get unless there's some unfortunate injury that happens. Um, Whittington's a hard runner. I know that there might be some, like Eric mentioned, some sort of nepotism with, with Lachlan and, and being his position coach at Western Kentucky. Don't care. He's six yards a carry. It's really good if, if, and, and by any means, by any standards. If I could tell you that a running back, if I could go out there and get six yards of carry, I bet Dan would have me. So no, no Whittington is good. I don't understand this negative slander towards him, and I would not not stand it, not stand for it, excuse me. Yeah, it's not happening. I mean, no. I, I, I don't Silly question. It's not, it's not happening. No offense uh, and, and drebbing. But was, Unless the only way it happens is if no Whittington is not on the team. Like that's that's, that's the only way it's happening, and I, I would be surprised if that happened. Well, thanks, Jared, for making it. So, and Drebbing's probably not asking a question anymore. So, good. No, I'm kidding. Continue to ask questions. <laughs> oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have some. He's just trying to overshadow me for biggest flub on the podcast. Uh, as I, I, at least you didn't use an F word. Um, Could have. I thought about it. Thought about it. We already got one F word. Kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> we already have one F bomb on leash. You might as well drop seven. Yeah, might as well have them all on here. Make it an NC seventeen rated podcast. Um, all right, last one. We're going hoops. Uh, I so would rather not do that because I'm the one that has to edit it. <laughs> you edit all the F words. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just beep them? Can you bleep them for us. <laughs> Matt, this one's coming to you though because this is a basketball question. So it's from yeah. at uh, B underscore Fotef one, who I think asked a couple of basketball questions in the past. Uh, what's a realistic conference record for the men's basketball team to make the NCAA tournament? Hashtag odds and audibles. Important win on Saturday, by the way, against yeah. Utah. They needed that really, really bad had they been swept there. Not saying it would have been end of the year, but you would have been putting yourself in a really tough spot, especially with the way things have gone in non-conference. So we've talked a little bit about this off podcast, Matt, but can you kind of outline? He asked for what's the realistic conference record. Maybe you do that and then provide context in terms of the net ranking and just kind of where they are from a from just from a, where, where their tournament life is right now. Yeah, they're three and two in conference right now. Their net is 66. Um, they're two and four in quad one games, two and one in quad two, one and two in quad three, which is going to be what really hurts them here. Um, those quad three losses are bad. It's, it's not ideal, even though Utah Valley and Irvine could be schools that get into the, the tournament. It's not good. They happened at home. They should not have happened. I think from a realistic standpoint, um, they play 18 conference games. Oregon's probably going to need to go 13 and five to give them a, a, a puncher's chance as an at-large bid. Um, meaning they have three more conference games that they can lose and have some kind of I don't even know if it, even that would be like comfort going into selection Sunday. Um, ideally 14 and four, maybe even 15 and three. Um, but knowing who they have to play this season remaining, that's hard to envision happening. Um, I, I think a 13 and five outlook is very optimistic for Oregon. Um, a 12 and six is probably more realistic. Uh, 11 and seven is probably more likely for, for Oregon, just knowing this team and the inconsistencies that they've had. Now they're getting healthy, which is a big plus. We should note Kuznard, Biddle, and Ethan Butler of all people um, played against Colorado. Ethan Butler made his career debut for Oregon. 
um, Kuznard made his career debut. And then Biddle and Kuznard played against Utah. Butler did, was not needed. Um, or the game didn't get a hand in a negative manner uh, for him to get on the floor. So that's a positive. Bartholomew could be back this week, maybe next week. Um, and like Eric asked me this question, and I'll relay it here again. The best case for Oregon is that they go like 12 and four They're in their final 16 games or something like that in, in the season. And they look really good. They don't get blown out in any of these games. And they maybe knock off in Arizona, which comes to town on Saturday. They get a road win at ASU in a couple of weeks, which ASU is a top 50 team, uh, or they're close to being a top 50 team, 58th in, in the net. But that would be another quad one game. Um, you don't lose at home the remaining of, of the year. You don't have any embarrassing upset losses or blowout losses to better teams. And at the end of the year, the, co- the committee will look at it and say, like, yes, they got blown out at, at Colorado in terrible fashion. UConn destroyed them. But they weren't healthy or they weren't at full percent. And now you look at this team with its full complement of players. Everyone's fully back into the rotation. They're playing. And, and Dana can say, we're 12-4. and four. We've got win over X, Y, and Z. And we're trending in the right direction. Put us in the tournament. That's how they get in. That's what they're going to have to do. How how realistic is this? I, I don't know. This team is so up and down. I mean, if, if they played like they did against Utah, against Colorado, they'd probably win that game. And, and they didn't. And you have one of, if not the worst loss in the Dana Altman era on Thursday. And then two days later, they didn't play great, but their intensity was way better. And they knock off Utah to give them their best win in the last year and a half. Which It's just – you can't count on this team to do anything consistently. No, you can't. And that's why I have a really hard time even seeing them go 11-7 and seven in their next 18 games. Um, it's a disappointing team. I mean, I know that they have they've had their injuries, um, but like I've said earlier in the season, I thought that actually kind of helped them because Will Richardson stayed on the floor for 40 minutes, and they knew their entire rotation with eight eight or nine guys. Um, I thought that guys coming back might kind of limit what their rotations look like, and you know, kind of get the sea legs underneath everybody, which I think you saw at Colorado, but then they came back at Utah, like Matt just mentioned. Um, that Utah win was was really important for Oregon, but. Um, I don't expect them to shoot 50% from deep maybe again this year, especially 13 to 26, which is really good for a college basketball game. Uh, it's just not a good shooting team. And when they get into scoring slumps, um, teams are just going to play zone and, and allow somebody to shoot as long as it's you know preferably not Will Richardson. Um, I will say the return of Nate Biddle does allow some more floor spacing and that he's a good shooter as well. Um, I like that Dana Altman has run out a Clay Ware and Nate Biddle lineup where you have somebody who could play more inside and wear and rebound, and you have Nate Biddle who could pick and roll or, excuse me, pick and pop. Um, that does bring me to my next point. Finally, Oregon learned how to play the pick and roll. Uh, I don't know. I've been clamoring for this all season long where Nate, Defale Dante will set a screen and then kind of just float to like the free throw line area and expect to catch the ball and do like a one dribble move. and. It, he needs to roll, and he rolled a lot against Utah and got to the rim, got easy baskets. So I liked that development on, on the offensive side of the ball. Defensively, I think they'll compete just because Dana Altman will have these guys ready. I just I just worry about any consistency, and I worry about if, if the opposing team has a lockdown defender on Will Richardson, how much that takes out of Oregon's offense, how much that takes out of their flow, and how much that takes out of the team in general if Will Richardson can't produce. Um, he's won them a lot of games this year um, and the, his supporting cast haven't necessarily won him a lot of games this season other than the fall I Dante. I just, I worry about what this team is going to do for the next 15 to 18 games. I could see one way or another. Um, I haven't seen anything this season that makes me want to believe it is the good way rather than the bad way. And I think that's a unfortunate thing to have this late into the season 
Um, they're still dealing with injuries. I don't know if they'll get a buy from the NCAA selection committee because that they're dealing with injuries this far into the season. If it was only the first four weeks, that might be a different case, but you know, we're, we're well past. We're, we're heading to the middle of January where they still don't have Keyshawn Bartholomew and that Kuznard and Biddle are really just coming back. Um, I think that might be a little too little too late to get some some sway from the NCAA selection committee. But, you know, I've been wrong before. I'll be happy to come on to the podcast and admit that I was terribly wrong after they go 20-0 and in their next 20 games and win the <laughs> league. But um, I just haven't seen anything the last couple of weeks that makes me very optimistic about this program right now. Matt, have, Matt, if, 16, Matt, if they if they went twenty Matt, if they went twenty and would they get in? Yeah, because they would win Vegas. Yes. Uh, yeah. They would, okay. and that would probably also put them in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Um, <laughs> yeah, they have, <laughs> they have uh, sixteen games remaining. One of those is is the first game in the Pac-12 tournament. So eight of those games are at home. So they play in the regular season eight home games, seven road games. They still have Cal twice on the schedule. Cal is the worst team in the league by far. Uh, They have to play at Oregon State, which is another bottom feeder in the conference. Um, Washington State and Stanford are teams who aren't playing well, but have talent to make things dicey for you. So I don't know if you can look at those games and say that they're automatic victories. Um, Washington still on the schedule. Um, I'm not sure how to quantify them. They have talent, but they're also terrible. Um, it, it It's a weird mix. You do have that game up in Seattle, though. So I won't say that's like an automatic game that they should just win. Um, so it, it's... There's winnable games, very easy winnable games, and then there's some some juggernauts like Saturday or start, starting Thursday. Arizona State's good; they're twelve and three. Mm-hmm. Um, Hurley has them playing well. Um, they kicked Oregon's ass uh, in Tempe last year. I was there for that. That was disgusting, and Dana was pissed about that one. Um, this will be the first time that they play ASU since that game. You've got. Utah at home, which will be another marquee game for you. You've got Arizona, Arizona State on the road, and then the L.A. schools. Um, so there's still opportunities here to turn things around. But like Jared said, like they haven't shown us anything all year to make us think that they can go on this seven-game win streak run You know that would propel them beyond the bubble and squarely into – the NCAA field, you know, at that point in the season. I, I I would think Jerry would agree here. Like they have the talent to do that, but they've just never shown it. And so we can't expect that. Um, and that's what's going to be a, like the storyline is what do we see from this Oregon team? And it's probably also what makes this team so frustrating is like individually, you can see the pieces, but they just haven't for now almost two years been able to put it together. Yeah, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the, the sentiment of that they have the talent to do so. I think we all came into the season saying, again, if everybody stays healthy and um, that, they, that they had the talent to do so, especially after Will Richardson announced that he would come back for another year. Um, you had good guard depth. You had a lot of front court depth with all very promising prospects, but just – hasn't come together at all. And again, that could be due to injury. It could be due to just running into the wrong teams at the wrong time, poor shooting nights, blah, blah, blah. But it just hasn't happened. And I'm, I'm not 100% convinced it will happen at one point this year. All right. It's going to do it for us here on the Austin Audible's podcast. I didn't think we were going to do this, but we got the show done in under an hour. Uh, that is tremendous work. Uh, Thank you for submitting your questions. Thank you for listening to the show. We'll be back later this week with an interview with GoDucks.com's Rob Mosley. Look forward to that one popping live. And then we'll also have a live stream also later this week. So stay tuned. You've been listening to the Auth and Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.